Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the intersection of philosophical naturalism with paleoconservatism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. So, for today's episode, we will be looking at a book called After the Flight 93 Election, The Vote That Saved America and What We Still Have to Lose, by Michael Anton. Uh, Now, last episode, I looked at Bronze Age Mindset by Bronze Age Pervert, and one of the reasons that I decided to review it was because uh, this author, Michael Anton, had reviewed Bronze Age Pervert's book uh, on the American Mind website, and Bronze Age Pervert responded, and there was some back and forth, and there were some other people who had uh, joined in the conversation. That's kind of how the American Mind website works, which is a fantastic website, by the way, uh, where it's sort of a a conversation, different people posting articles in response to other people. And so it had sparked a bit of conversation about that book, um, and I had already read the the essay that this book is, is centered around, and I really enjoyed it. And so when uh, Anton and Bronze Age Pervert began having a, a sort of a dialogue, I thought, let me go in and review both of their books and see if, if I can kind of see what they may have in common and what they may uh, be differing on. So this book, like I said, is centered around an essay uh, called uh, The Flight 93 Election. And then he wrote another essay afterwards called Restatement on Flight 93, and he wrote this one in response to some criticism that his first essay had had acquired. Both of these were written in sep- in uh, September of 2016, or were published in September of 2016, uh, shortly before the 2016 presidential election, and that's what they are about. And he essentially makes the case that we are in a state of emergency, or particularly conservatism is in a state of emergency, um, and, you know, if you are a conservative, then you would deduce that the nation as a whole is in a state of emergency, um, in, in particular with how things are going to unfold in the future, given the uh, absolute dominance that the left has achieved culturally and, uh, and the, the changes to our demographics and the changes to our culture that are resulting from this absolute dominance that it's sort of the last chance for conservatives to try to um, reclaim some sort of power and put the brakes on the leftist agenda. And so whether or not people really thought Donald Trump was was the, the best candidate or the most conservative candidate or the right guy for the job or, or presidential in nature or what have you, it isn't really relevant or it wasn't really relevant in 2016. The point was, it doesn't matter. The plane because of Flight 93. If you don't know, Flight 93 is the um, the plane on 9/11 that crashed into the ground because the people on board the plane uh, seized control of the cockpit from the terrorists and crashed it into the ground. The analogy here is that. Uh, we have to seize control of the government whether or not we really know how to fly it. Whether or not Donald Trump knows how to fly the plane, um, I won't say it's irrelevant, but uh, it doesn't matter in the sense that the people who are currently flying the plane uh, are going to uh, use it to destroy America. It sounds kind of hyperbolic perhaps, but uh, when you hear his case and, and when you understand uh, – what the left is doing to this country and how they're doing it, uh, I think he made a very strong case. Uh, I was a Trump supporter. I was a Trump voter. I voted for him in the primary. I voted for him in the general election. Um, Not specifically because of these things, although they were certainly a part of why I voted for Trump. Um, I've always been very concerned with international trade and the fact that so much of the stuff that we buy is made overseas. Um, and I feel like the, that we need to restore American manufacturing, like that's critical. Uh, and so I've 
I've, for some time now, so, uh, well, several years before the, the election of Trump, I've been very interested in protectionist economics, the American system, uh, Friedrich List, tariffs, that whole sort of uh, pr- protective economic nationalism, as it's sometimes called. And Donald Trump was the first and only uh, major politician, uh, presidential candidate, to actually make a case of that. Bernie Sanders talked about it a little bit. And I even considered voting for Bernie, uh, you know, at the very start of the election. I was maybe not quite as informed about politics as I am now. But I knew that I wasn't a socialist, but I also knew that it's critical that we get these manufacturing jobs back. And Bernie had talked about our trade balance and he had talked about restoring American manufacturing. So I thought, well, you know, maybe Bernie could do it. But Trump made that a centerpiece of his campaign and that was why uh, it was real easy for me to say Trump is is the guy. Well, I mean, also, Bernie obviously didn't win the nomination. I was a Republican, so I wasn't going to vote in the Democratic primary. But uh, either way, the point is that he had, he had written these essays about the presidential election and then wrote another essay afterwards. Uh, I think he wrote this third essay last year in 2018. And... Uh, then he added those two essays to the new one that he had written, packaged it all together, and put it out as a book called After the Flight 93 Election. And that's the book that I'm going to be looking at today. It's a short book. It's less than 100 pages. It was only put out this year, 2019. And uh, I'll tell you, I've got mixed feelings about it. There are parts of it that I really like, but I don't feel like the book as a whole quite lives up to the power of the initial essay. Um, and I'll get into why a little bit as we go. But basically, the new essay that he wrote was not a follow up. So the, it's called after the flight 93 election. But the new book, the new essay doesn't approach this same scenario from the perspective of after the election. In other words, okay, Donald Trump is president. Now what? Now let's think about where we go from here. Um, and that wasn't what the third essay, the, 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 the follow-up essay that he wrote only last year, that wasn't what that essay was about. That essay he actually calls a pre-statement on Flight 93. And in that essay, uh, which is longer than the other two, he essentially lays out his, his political principles um, in a more abstract manner. It's, it's more of like, the, the, these are the principles that I held prior to writing the Flight 93 election. That's kind of how he presents it. Like, this is where I was coming from on the whole when I wrote that election. This is what I believed. And so this, these are the things that prompt me, prompted me to write that essay, um, which is good for what it is, but it's not really what I was hoping for. I was hoping for like a post-election analysis of – Maybe how things have changed, how things are changing, and how they can change in the future. And most importantly, where what do we do now? Um, the election that this whole book was originally about, or that this essay was about, was the 2016 election. Now, clearly, um, Michael Anton wants to reelect President Trump, and he's got, by the way, he's got an, a recent essay uh, in the Claremont Review of Books about the impeachment process, which is an absolute uh, banger of an essay. It's awesome. Uh, it really breaks it all down. Talks about the administrative state and stuff. I mean, Michael Anton is a, is like a superhero of the right in way in many ways. But I can't help but feel like this book didn't come through quite for what I was looking for. Uh, but either way, it's it's still good and it's not very long. So I'm not going to read a tremendous amount of it. But I am going to read. Uh, looks like I've got six sections here set aside that I want to read. Some of them a little longer. Some of them a little shorter. Um, and we're going to look at where he where he's coming from, and uh, we'll we'll look at his we'll look at a little bit from all three of these essays. Uh, so I'm going to jump in here with the first section that I wanted to read when he talks about uh, he talks about the f- kind of the fundamental principles that lead him to uh, be a conservative, I guess. Uh, and and this is what he says. He says, "quote." Aristotle begins both his politics and his Nicomachean ethics with the sensible and true observation that all human activity aims at some good. 
Our activity therefore presupposes that the good exists and that it is knowable. Most men, most of the time, simply assume they know what is good. Mostly this comes down to knowing what they want and assuming it is good, or assuming that their own particular ways and habits are good. Political philosophy was born when some men, instead of simply identifying the good with the objects of human desire or with their own customs and traditions, began an inquiry to discover the true human good. That inquiry presumes that human nature and the human good can be discovered and known, or at least better known, if perhaps never fully and finally known, through reasoned analysis. It is important to understand that any account of good and bad right and wrong, justice and injustice, that does not begin from these premises, is ipso facto non-rational. Reject this starting point, and one is left with only two alternatives. Either take guidance from a revealed account of the good and what it commands, or assert that justice is simply a matter of human will, i.e., assert that justice does not exist, independent of preference and choice, but it's simply whatever this or that people in this or that time say it is. Tradition offers no reassurance because tradition, without a rational basis, is, in the last analysis, just an unconscious resort to will. But non-rational does not necessarily mean irrational. A rational account of justice is not inherently incommensurable with a revealed account. It is true that philosophy at the highest level refuses to submit to any authority, and insists on independently investigating every claim to truth. Revelation, by contrast, holds that the true account of the human good begins from God's word, which reason is incapable of fully understanding and which is impious to question. Yet it would be strange if the Creator's commandments did not accord with rationally discoverable moral principles. It would be equally strange if the reasoned investigation of morality in a created world could discern no rational moral principle at all. Modern natural science has shown that the physical world is governed by discoverable laws that accurately predict the behavior of much in and of that world. Why cannot something similar be true for the human world, and more specifically, the moral world? End quote. Okay, so he puts forward a couple ideas here that uh, I'm maybe a little, I'm a little skeptical about. I think that uh, he basically says that you know, we're all aiming toward the good. And we, the and there is such a thing as a true human good. He says that we've transcended the idea we're thinking that the good is what we want or what our particular ways and habits are, but there, there is some true human good which can be discovered by uh, reason and rationality, rational inquiry. Well, I, th I think that that's kind of a presumption that you might not be able to make. Because I think that what we aim toward and what we consider good, we have an intuitive sense of, of good. If, if, your rational, if your rational and reasonable inquiry toward what is good uh, leads you to believe that genocide is good, are you simply going to accept that? Or are you going to have a, a sort of intuitive revulsion at the idea Ultimately, good and evil are something that we have an intuitive sense of. And the reason for that is because it's hardwired biologically into our brains because we've evolved to acquire a moral sense in order to hold our civilizations and our societies together. Um, and so it's not – morality is not the, the sort of thing that we could or should – simply arrive at by rational inquiry. Uh, emotion plays a role in what we consider good. And he seems to discard this as like uh, will. He says that without reason and rationality, you've only got revelation and human will. Um, now, I would postulate, and this is a, uh, an idea that I want to develop further in this series, not in this episode, but essentially... Our human will is driven by our instincts and our intuitions, and it it's a little bit different for everybody, just like everyone's, say, everyone's face is a little bit different, but we still know a human face when we see one, even though everyone's face is slightly different. Everyone's morality 
is slightly different. Everyone's intuitive sense of morality is slightly different because it's biological and biologically we're all a little bit different. Um, that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as as a, a sort of a uniform sense of what is and isn't morally right. Just like the fact that everyone's face is different doesn't negate the fact that there is such a thing that is a human face that is, has identifiable features to it. And there is a certain sense in which, like, let's just let's just say someone has one eye. We would say that's an abnormal face, right? There's a normal face of having two eyes, and then there's a deformed face that's abnormal. Um, we wouldn't say that, you know, some people are born with one eyes and some people are born with two eyes, and it, you know, it's who it's all up in the air. Who knows? People have two eyes, and then there's deviations. There's a standard, and then there's the deviation or the abnormality, you know? And like, like, um, someone's nose, and I, I know this sounds kind of weird to make these analogies, but when you look at morality as a, as a biological phenomenon, and it's not entirely biological, but it's, it's at core based on biological phenomena in the brain. So if you were to look at someone's nose and it was huge, you might say it's abnormally large nose, deformity, deformity. But where where do you really draw the line as to where someone's nose is so big that it's like a deformity versus just like that's the particulars of their face? I know this sounds strange, but if you take it to morality, someone might, you know, you can't necessarily draw crisp lines around where a healthy morality is and unhealthy morality, but someone might be psychopathic. They might be like a psychopathic killer or something. And it's not to say that human morality ranges this, you know, this spectrum from saintly to psychopathic killer and everywhere in between. There's a general normal morality, just like there's a, no a normal size of someone's nose, you know, and then there's, then there's someone who's got a deformity, a facial deformity, and then there's someone who's got a deformed morality. And you can't necessarily draw a crisp line between the two, just like you can't necessarily draw a crisp line between purple and blue, right? It's not a hard, fast line to say, here's the dividing point between purple and blue. But you know purple and blue when you see it, right? It Just because you can't draw these defined lines about human morality. and so, And so my point is that Everybody's morality of what he describes as will, everyone's human will or their desire is a little different. And so we've got these constructions of religion that make it, that kind of put parameters on around it so that we can say, okay, well, in order for us to have a functional civilization, let's codify what is and isn't morally right. Let's put artificial parameters around it since it's since it fluctuates and there are no hard and fast r lines or rules or, or or borders within what is moral and immoral in nature but there's still a general sense that there's okay this is moral this is immoral you know um just in the same way that you could you could generally say in most cases you could tell a normal healthy human face from a deformed face you could tell the color blue from the color purple and you could tell morally right from morally wrong, even though there are no crisp lines. But society, in order to make things function smoothly, says, we're just going to say these are the moral, these are the accurate moral things, and, and these other things over here are immoral. And it's a, it's a sort of an arbitrary uh, division put down, but it's not totally random. It's not totally arbitrary. It's not like everybody, you know, every society just kind of rolls the dice and comes up with a moral code. It's, it's based on human morality. So, so you have these, he says you have reason and then you have revelation and then you have will. And if you don't accept reason as the method for, for coming up with a moral code or, or, or a sense of the good, you know, and, and I think, you know, the good and, and morality, obviously these things are tied together. The, the good or what the good life is or what people should be striving to be. If you don't rationally determine that, then all you're left with is, is human will, which he makes out to be this capricious sort of, uh, you know, ev everybody is going to do whatever they want to do and there's no real basis for it. It's just, it's almost like a, a power struggle. If you're the strongest, then you get to make the rules sort of thing or revelation. And then he says like, now reason should conform to 
Revelation. Because it wouldn't make any sense for Revelation to say this is moral and then for reason to say something else. And But this process of rationalization and reason to come up with something that is fundamentally not really a reason to, a, a rational function requires some mental gymnastics and a lot of times what happens you've got all these different philosophers that that attempt to come up with these re, these reasonable or, or rational reason based uh, moral systems and none of them are really exactly the same so like okay well which one is the reasonable rational rationable rational one um and and it's kind of like you've got an especially if you're a religious person you've got an idea of what morality is you for both from your intuition as well as you know r- confirmed by your religious beliefs and and if you believe that the morality of of the bible or whatever your religion is is divine and inspired by god then you're going to wind up reasoning your way toward confirming that same thing that you already believed. Because there is no real re- rational basis for morality in that manner. You're going to construct a rationality that confirms the religious belief, and the religious belief simply confirms the biological fact. It all comes down to the biological fact. Anyway, um, I've gone off on a tangent here, disputing his fundamental pr- principles but a lot of what he winds up drawing I, I agree with his end re, the end result of his concept of of um, human societies striving toward uh, toward virtue and uh, a flourishing life and and people um, both having their basic needs met what he calls mere life as well as like a, a, a flourishing or or higher life of pursuing virtues and pursuing intellectual pursuits and art and beauty and these other things, whether he, he rationalizes his way toward that, I find that more intuitive. Regardless, <clears throat> uh, I, we kind of come to the same place. So I'm going to move on a little bit. As he steps past the more lofty um, ideals and into the particulars, he says, quote, first, Men are equal only in possessing equally the same natural rights. Men naturally differ in virtue, intelligence, talent, and other traits. None of these natural inequalities provide a just title to rule others without their consent, but they do result in inequalities of wealth, honors, social standing, power, etc., especially when and where equal natural rights to utilize unequal talents are properly secured. Since excellence in husbandry, the arts and sciences, commerce, and many other endeavors is a boon to individuals, to society, indeed to all mankind, this inequality of outcomes is welcome. More important, it is unjust to place arbitrary limits on the natural freedom to exercise one's talents. Yet government has a duty to prevent natural inequality from degenerating into a de facto oligarchy. The best way to ensure this is through rigorous, impartial enforcement of the laws. Second, any social compact, and hence any political community, is inherently particular. Its full privileges extend only to those men who have consented to its terms, and whose membership has been consented to by all other citizen members. The equal natural rights of all men do not demand or imply world government or open borders. To the contrary, a social compact without limits is impossible, a self-contradiction. A compact that applies indiscriminately to all is not a compact. Since mutual consent is an indispensable foundation of political legitimacy, membership in the political community must be invitation only. Moreover, just as nature endows men equally with inalienable rights, Human nature similarly entitles the nations of the world to a separate and equal station with respect to other nations. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master, Lincoln said. Applied to international relations, we may similarly affirm that as no, as- as no nation is by right a colony, none should be an empire. Third, form must always fit matter. In this sense is the actual country, the facts on the ground, the people, their language, traditions, customs, and religions, the topography, resources, and climate, the geographical site and situation, and relations with neighbors and other world powers. 
Form is the regime, or mode of government, and above all, the principles informing that mode. There may be, as ancient philosophers from Plato to Aristotle to Cicero assert, one regime that is simply best. But they add that this best form is not always practicable or possible. It is suitable only for the finest matter, and only in those rare instances where and when circumstances permit. While the American regime takes its bearings from human nature, this in itself does not mean that it can be successfully applied anywhere to anyone. It is a perhaps sad but nonetheless intractable truth that not all peoples in all times and places are ready or able to assume the responsibilities of liberty or to secure their equal natural rights through republican government. The particular traditions, customs, laws, talents, education, religious practices, and private habits of a people determine the likelihood of successfully applying the American solution, and thus the wisdom of the attempt. Even the American people themselves were not inherently or immediately capable of creating or sustaining a republican regime. It took well over a century of quasi-self-rule via colonial legislatures, plus the crucibles of the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, to make us ready for it. The great task before the founders of any government is thus to devise a form as consistent as possible with timeless truths about human nature, yet also appropriate to the particular characteristics and circumstances of an actual people at a given time. Finally, Republican government requires a measure of commonality in customs, habits, and opinions. Republicanism is not possible when the people become so fractured that private or sectional or group interests override agreement on the common good. That incorporation of new citizens into the social compact is possible and even salutary in certain circumstances, but only if the newcomers possess Republican spirit and sufficiently adopt the customs, habits, and opinions of the existing majority. Immigrants must desire and be capable of assimilation, and the country accepting them must insist on it. In determining whether to welcome newcomers and in what numbers, a republic's overriding consideration must always be the preservation of republican habits and institutions plus the well-being and desires of the existing citizenry. Another paramount consideration must be the capacity of the existing citizenry and its institutions and economy to absorb and assimilate newcomers. This capacity varies according to times and circumstances and is never unlimited. In sum, a republic that opens its doors to immigrants must choose carefully whom and how many to accept. It must insist on and impel assimilation, and it must be able and willing to recognize its own limits in successfully assimilating newcomers and protect its citizens accordingly. End quote. Okay, so in that section, he basically says that, all right, we've got these eternal principles of human nature or eternal principles of striving toward the good or what have you, and these are best manifested in republicanism, and he talks about that more in a different section where he talks about the value of the American uh, the American project of republican government. Uh, but he, I like this section where he kind of frames it within certain particulars. He says that – he says he puts out four points, the first of which is that Men naturally differ in virtue, intelligence, talent, and other traits. So we're not all actually born equal in our capacities. The whole concept of equality is one that says we have equal rights under the Republican form of government. We all are equal before the law. Um, and so attempts to make us equal in outcome uh, are, are not – not conducive to this sort of uh, equality and and the actual the inequality that results from different people's different levels of talent is actually positive because it allows people to reach their fullest potential. Uh, the second thing he says that is uh, particular is that he says uh, any social compact and hence any political community is inherently particular. Its full privileges extend only to those men who have consented to its terms. Essentially, the social compact applies to a single group of people. It doesn't apply to everyone. And so uh, on that 
reason we don't want a world government and we don't want open borders. Uh, his third point is very similar to his second point. If I was writing this, I probably would have folded these two together. But his third point is that form must always fit matter so that the social uh, the social compact and the Republican form of government manifests itself differently according to the facts on the ground, the particular aspects of any given civilization or people or nation, they're going to do things a little differently in accord with their traditions, and the traditions are probably going to be different from one nation to the other. And so that that the different cultures, the different ways of thinking, the different ways of approaching life are going to color the uh, the Republican form of government in one way or another, and that is that is a necessary part of it. Now, I probably would have folded that into the second one, but the last point that he makes is that Republican government requires a measure of commonality in customs, habits, and opinions. In other words, uh, you can't have a functional Republican government if the people have absolutely nothing in common with each other. Uh, if there is no common culture, there is no common language, there are no common goals or objectives, there is not even a common dedication to republicanism. You can't just let anybody into your country with regardless of what their, what their ideas are. You can't have a country that is fundamentally fractured about the nature of reality, the nature of government, the nature of humanity, the goals of humanity, the goals of a civilization, etc., etc., and expect that that the republicanism is this magic uh, elixir that's going to bring everybody on board and create this peaceful functional society there are the the unifying elements of a civilization or a society are critical to having a peaceful society where people all agree that yes this is what we're doing this is how we're doing it these these are the constitutional principles we all support them we all you know obviously this isn't to say that nobody should ever be able to dissent but it is to say that having that common thread of a common culture and common languages or a common language and common uh, goals and objectives and ethics are a critical part of having a nation and having the Republican form of government work. So um, I agree with all of those points. And uh, like I said, we come to the same point even if through different circuitous means. And then the third section I want to read is when he talks about leftism. And he talks about uh, essentially what leftism is doing to undermine uh, this Republican form of government, and a little bit about the dangers of the modern leftist approach. So in this section, he says, quote, As we have seen, there are only three possible bases for justice, reason, revelation, or will. Post-1960s leftism rejects revelation without so much as a thought. It is ambivalent about will. On the one hand, it grasps that its own rejection of traditional moral reasoning leaves no consistent ground for questioning will, and knows that it owes many of its greatest triumphs to the assertion of will. On the other hand, it also intuits that recourse to will alone is somehow insufficient or unseemly. Hence, it prefers to believe itself to be fully rational and even scientific. This self-congratulation is unfounded. First, because the left's relationship with science is tenuous at best. Leftists know that their grip on power is strengthened when their claims possess the veneer of scientific prestige and respectability, so they strive always to package their claims to justice in the language of science. This is why the highest sources of moral authority in our time are peer-reviewed articles written by research university faculty. Since the left's hold on the universities is stronger than that of medieval monks on the monasteries, in practice, this amounts to the left approving the left, vouching for one unreplicable study after another in an endless echo chamber, or perhaps better to say feedback loop, since the noise becomes ever louder and shriller. But the left also knows that science is not a reliable ally. 
Sometimes, scientific conclusions support a moral claim or policy goal on behalf of the disadvantaged, but often they don't. When they do, they are held to be unquestionable. Yet, as one controversy after another has shown, any time a scientific conclusion, no matter how rigorous its basis, undermines or contradicts a leftist claim, it is not merely rejected, but denounced. The left increasingly goes so far as to insist that certain lines of scientific inquiry are simply immoral to pursue. Science must be subordinated to the moral claims and goals of social justice, which are the true authority or highest value. Second, post-1960s leftism stands or falls by the concept of group rights, which is morally and logically incoherent. A right is a moral claim that all individuals justly hold vis-a-vis all other individuals, enforced, if at all, by their common government. If all men are created equal, they must be endowed by their creator with equal natural rights. If some men, by virtue of group membership, that is to say, by birth, have more or greater rights than others, then men are inherently unequal. Group rights, in practice, equals de facto aristocracy. It demands a sort of caste system, something leftists used to insist they were against, in which people are designated as better or worse according to lineage. As an aside, we may note the irony that ardent social justice warriors make essentially the same claim as slavery's greatest defenders. In a republic, group rights inevitably lead to faction and the destruction of internal peace especially when viewed as resulting from hereditary guilt. The concept requires that the innocent living be held perpetually accountable for the sins of the actually or allegedly guilty dead. It means that some people are innately bad, simply according to birth, no matter what they actually do or do not do. This notion is antithetical to any conception of moral responsibility, of individual culpability, or rectitude. In truth, The post-1960s left co-opts the language of justice and rights as a rhetorical device to get what it wants, the transfer of power, honor, and wealth between groups as retribution for past offenses. Since the concept of social justice denies both natural rights and revelation, its real basis is simply will. We want these things, therefore we say they are good. We don't like you, therefore we say you are bad. The practical wreckage from this understanding of justice has been immense. A decades-long crime spree launched by liberal leniency that was only partially brought under control at great cost and only after taking hundreds of thousands of lives and that appears to be resurging, at least in certain cities, where homicides have recently risen for the first time since the late 1980s. The sexual revolution, which appears to be on track to destroy the family and every segment of society below the upper middle class, has deprived millions of children of a stable home and made millions of both sexes lonely and miserable. The collapse of the universities, especially the humanities and social sciences, which trivialize and despise their ostensible subject matter, while propagandizing students to hate their country, ongoing mass immigration that enriches the tippy-top of the socio-economic ladder while imposing the costs on everyone else, and fundamentally transforms one American community after another. Foreign policy weakness and an inability to win wars, coupled with foolish overextension and hubris, limitless government expansion and intrusiveness, increasing restrictions on speech and thought, including the unpersoning of dissidents, and campaigns to turn heterodox thoughts and guilt by association, something else the left used to insist it was strongly against, into grounds for unemployability for life. End quote. So, yeah, I'm not going to review all that, really. It's a, it was a sort of long section, but uh, essentially the, the left, his argument is that, is that the left essentially just wants power and uh, uses all of these notions of science and justice and uh, and rights and everything else as just tools to acquire power. And I want to draw special attention to his talk about science there because he's absolutely right. The left, the leftist grasp on 
the mantle of being the party of science or what have you is very tenuous. They don't actually support any science that undermines their message. Their message comes first, their ideology comes first, and the science must conform to that. If it doesn't, uh, professors, researchers are publicly humiliated, removed from universities, removed from pu publishing, um, basically unpersoned, as he says. Uh, research into much of social science that is still allowed to happen continually indicates that many of the leftists' stated uh, objectives are not practical, not practical, not feasible, uh, that their assertions about the nature of society are false, their assertions about human nature are fundamentally false, uh, but this is simply derided as pseudoscience. That's the terminology that they use. They will go to professors at Harvard University, and if the results of their studies or the, or the conclusions that they draw uh, don't conform to leftism, well, that's pseudoscience. Okay. I don't believe you. I think that science, uh, as we learn more about human nature and as we learn more about uh, our evolutionary, uh, the evolutionary processes that got us to where we are and what, you know, why we have the tendencies that we have, you're going to find that the, much of the conservative assertions about the way people are and much of the uh, the social norms that have been encoded in traditions are going to be proven to be both correct and useful. Um, and I think this is an area where the right really needs to begin to fight aggressively. Uh, and that's, you know, to go down another tangent here, that's sort of the reason for my podcast in some ways. I was thinking about this recently and... and uh, you know, we've got to reclaim the universities. That is where the rot comes from. That is where the left, that, the left has been very strategically successful. They have been very successful in a whole host of areas. And it would behoove us to look at their strategy and figure out how it is that they got as much power as they have. We can't just say, well, the left controls the universities. Well, the left controls the media. Well, the left controls Hollywood. Well, the left controls big tech. Well, the left controls... We're just going to retreat, retreat, retreat from all these different areas. We're going to homeschool our kids. We're going to boycott the companies and blah, blah, blah. We're going to... But we never stop and ask ourselves how they got so much power. It wasn't given to them. They took it. And how did they take it? They started in the universities. The first thing they did is they took control of the universities, and now the universities are so overwhelmingly controlled by the left, it's like 100 to 1. Um, and so we might want to do several things. And in, in this, in, to the extent that we cannot reclaim them, we need to abandon them and create new universities and new institutions of learning. Um, but we also should maybe try to reclaim the, those universities that we might be more able to reclaim. Um, I don't know as though we can engage in a long countermarch through the institutions. I used to believe that was what we needed to do. Now I start to realize that the reason that the left's march through the institutions was so successful is because we didn't see it coming. If we were to try to do the same thing to them, they would see it coming because they already did it. We used to look at the universities as institutions of learning. The left does not view the university as an institution of learning. We used to view a variety of discourse and a variety of opinions as being critical to this learning process. The left does not view that as critical because it does not view the, inst the university as an institution of learning. They view it as a tool, a weapon. And... Uh, I guess to get back on my point, we need to have, if we're going to reclaim the universities in any way, we're going to have to have arguments that uh, are going to be effective in debating them. We need to defeat them in debate at every option that we have. 
We need to be able to counter all of their arguments. We need to understand all of their arguments, be able to counter them, be able to have better arguments. So not only do we dismantle their arguments, but we propose better, more realistic arguments, more in line with scientific understanding and research. We're not going to be able to reclaim the universities if all of our arguments rely on religion or revelation in some way. Those arguments don't hold any water to someone who is not religious. It's a, it's a waste of time and effort to make arguments based on religion in trying to convince someone who's not religious uh, that your position is correct. And so we need to be able to have arguments based on science, research, study, based on reason, based on philosophy. Uh, we need to be able to have those sorts of foundations to our positions, not just religious foundations, in order for us to be able to claim control of secular universities. And so that's kind of what I want to do in my podcast, even though it's, you know, it's not, I'm not a university professor, but I hope to be able to explore some foundations for uh, non-religious foundations for the express purpose of using these arguments to reclaim control of the universities. But that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a tangent. Um, but I think he is right about science in that regard. So let's move on. He, in the next section that I want to read, uh, he begins to talk about the fact that conservatives have failed. So at this point I'm moving into, uh, his essay, The Flight 93 Election. Everything that I've been reading up to then was from that, uh, that last essay he wrote. He puts it at the beginning of the book where he provides the princ- the underlying principles for, uh, for the other published essays that created such a stir. So this is from the Flight 93 election, the first essay that he had written in this trilogy that created that, uh, that, that big stir when he talks about the failure of conservatism. He says, quote, what has conservatism achieved lately in the last 20 years? The answer, which appears to be nothing, might seem to lend credence to the plea that our ideas haven't been tried, except that the same conservatives who generate those ideas are in charge of selling them to the broader public. If their ideas haven't been tried, who is ultimately at fault? The whole enterprise of Conservatism Inc. reeks of failure. Its sole recent and ongoing success is its own self-preservation. Conservative intellectuals never tire of praising entrepreneurs and creative destruction. Dare to fail, they exhort businessmen. Let the market decide. Except, um, not with respect to us. Or is their true market not the political arena, but the fundraising circuit? Only three questions matter. First, how bad are things really? Second, what do we do right now? Third, what should we do for the long term? End quote. So it's, that's obviously a very short section there, but he just points out uh, crisply and clearly how conservatism has been on a uh, failing streak for the past 30 years or so. And I would even postulate that it's really been on a losing streak since uh, for 100 years, since before it was even identified. Uh, the objectives of the progressive left have been advanced from the end of World War I uh, to the present, or even to the beginning. Woodrow, from Woodrow Wilson on, uh, our successes as conservatives have been few and far between. Um, and he says that many conservatives simply say that, you know, well, it would work if we, if, if we would do it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it would work if we would do it. The point is, we've got to do it. And they haven't won. They haven't won enough power or control to be able to do it. And when they do gain power, they don't really do anything. They just prop up businesses, and those businesses are fickle. And as we've seen now, they've decided that they're going to side with the left in many cases. So all the work that conservatives have done in propping up big businesses for nothing, when big business decides it's in their best interests to side with the squeaky wheel of the progressive left. Uh, politics is downstream from culture, as has been said, and conservatism has abjectly failed at controlling culture or influencing culture. 
All of the mechanisms for cultural influence have been seeded. As I mentioned, the university is at its core, but every other thing that I mentioned, the media and everything else, has all been seeded to the left. Nothing has been fought for with any vig- vigor. Um, it's all been uh, uh, congratulating ourselves on our purity while we decline into irrelevance. And for many people, that's not sufficient, not even close to sufficient, which is why there is so much current revolt in the Republican Party among uh, coming from people who want to fight harder, who want to win. And that's what we liked about Donald Trump. He's winning. It's almost a joke, but the reality is we want someone who's willing to fight and willing to win and is going to do whatever is necessary to win because when you are in an ideological war, which is what the left is engaging in, you need to fight back and not just congratulate yourself on your purity as you fade away. That's not sufficient. So his Flight 93 election essay was a real indictment against conservatives. And he talks about Trump a little bit. I'm not going to really talk so much about Trump. I'm not going to quote the sections where he talks about Trump because Trump is not the really the relevant thing here. He's just a politician. He wasn't even a politician at the time. He's just a dude, a billionaire. The point is that one man alone can't fix this. The entire conservative movement needs to be turned inside out and rebuilt from the ground up in order for us to save this nation. And I I run into a problem where I'm conflicted because I don't want to see anyone throwing dynamite into the conservative movement when winning elections is actually incredibly important right now. On the other hand, if the conservatives are willing to accept failure, then they need to have the reins of leadership taken from them and given to people who are not willing to accept failure. So so that's the internal struggle in the Republican Party right now. <clears throat> and that's a, a, my two cents there. Now, let's move on a little bit. He talks, um, he talks now about uh, more, a little bit more about the left. He talks about the ways that the deck is stacked against conservatives. And obviously the, the stacking of the deck is all at the hands of the liberals. We've allowed them to stack the deck because we were asleep at the wheel. So he says, quote, the deck is stacked overwhelmingly against us. I will mention but three ways. First, the opinion making elements, the universities and the media above all, are wholly corrupt and wholly opposed to everything we want and increasingly even to our existence. What else are the wars on cisgenderism, formerly known as nature, and on the supposed white privilege of broke hillbillies really about? If it hadn't been abundantly clear for the last 50 years, the campaign of 2015 to 2016 must surely have made it evident to even the meanest capacities that the intelligentsia, including all the organs through which it broadcasts its propaganda, is overwhelmingly partisan and biased. Against this onslaught, conservative media is a nullity, barely a whisper. It cannot be heard above the blaring of what has been aptly called the megaphone. Second, our Washington generals self-handicap and self-censor to an absurd degree. Lenin is supposed to have said that the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. But with an opposition like ours, why bother? Our leaders and dissenters bend over backward to play by the self-sabotaging rules the left sets for them. Fearful, beaten dogs have more thymos. Third, and most important, the ceaseless importation of third-world foreigners with no tradition of taste for or experience in liberty means that the electorate grows more left, more democratic, less Republican, less small r Republican, and less traditionally American with every cycle. As does, of course, the U.S. population, which only serves to reinforce the other two causes outlined above. This is the core reason why the left, the Democrats, and the bipartisan junta 
categories distinct but very much overlapping, think they are on the cusp of a permanent victory that will forever obviate the need to pretend to respect democratic and constitutional niceties. Because they are. It's also why they treat open borders as the absolute value. The one principle that, when their principles collide, they prioritize above all the others. If that fact is insufficiently clear, consider this. Trump is the most liberal Republican nominee since Thomas Dewey. He departs from conservative orthodoxy in so many ways that National Review still hasn't stopped counting. But let's stick to just the core issues animating his campaign. On trade, globalization, and war, Trump is to the left, conventionally understood, not only of his own party, but of his Democrat opponent. And yet the left and the junta are at one with the house-broken conservatives in their determination, desperation, not merely to defeat Trump, but to destroy him. What gives? Oh, right. There's that other issue. The sacredness of mass immigration is the mystic cord that unites America's ruling and intellectual classes. Their reasons vary somewhat. The left and the Democrats seek ringers to form a permanent electoral majority. They, or many of them, also believe the academic intellectual lie that America's inherently racist and evil nature can be expiated only through ever greater diversity. The junta, of course, craves cheaper and more docile labor. It also seeks to legitimize and deflect unwanted attention from its wealth and power by pretending that its open borders stance is a form of noblesse oblige. The Republicans and the conservatives? Both, of course, desperately want absolution from the charge of racism. For the latter, this at least makes some sense. No Washington general can take the court, much less cash his check, with that epithet dancing over his head like some satanic spirit. But for the former, this priestly grace comes at the direct expense of their worldly interests. Do they honestly believe that the right enterprise zone or charter school policy will arouse 50.01% of our newer voters to finally reveal their natural conservatism at the ballot box. It hasn't happened anywhere yet, and shows no signs that it ever will. But that doesn't stop the Republican refrain. More, more, more! No matter how many elections they lose, how many districts flip forever blue, how rarely, if ever, their immigrant, immigrant vote cracks 40%, the answer is always the same, just like Angela Merkel after yet another rape, shooting, bombing, or machete attack. More, more, more! This is insane. This is the mark of a party, a society, a country, a people, a civilization that wants to die. Trump alone among candidates for high office in this, or in the last seven at least, cycles, has stood up to say, I want to live. I want my party to live. I want my country to live. I want my people to live. I want to end the insanity. End quote. So I like that section. He's He re, he really nails it of just how important this open borders thing is. Um, you know, he, 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 he mentions three, uh, three areas in which the deck is stacked against the conservatives. The first is what I talked about before, the universities and the media, the opinion-making mechanisms... Uh, if, if you were trying to take control of a society, the first thing you go for is the opinion-making mechanisms. You've got that, you've got everything, especially the opinions of children. Uh, and so they get to decide what we think, how we think it. And it's very effective. Not completely effective, but nonetheless very effective. Secondly, uh, the, the total, uh, weakness of the conservative, uh, leadership and I'm not going to get into that right now. But thirdly is the importation of uh, third world foreigners who overwhelmingly vote left. They come from socialist countries because those socialist countries are failing. And they come here and they vote socialist. And that is going to make it harder and harder for Republicans to ever win elections. And that is why they're so opposed to Trump. As he states, 
it used to be entirely viable, and still is to some extent, for uh, Democrats and people on the left to oppose globalization and to oppose free trade and to oppose uh, endless foreign wars. These are all positions that people on the left have taken quite successfully in some cases. And yet they hate Trump with a passion because of the immigration issue. Because at the end of the day, as they say, everything else falls to the immigration issue. And that is why uh, I believe that it is entirely possible and, frankly, really good strategy for Republicans to court the black vote. If you look at the black percentage of the population, it hovers around 13%. Projections for the future keep it around the same. It's not changing. It's not radically changing. Why? Because African Americans have been largely assimilated into the European-based culture of the United States of America. And we're not importing millions of people from African countries. We're importing millions of people from, from Central and South America, primarily Central America. And so the black voters' interests at this time, as Democrats decide that the people that they really care about are the illegal immigrants, but black Americans are not illegal immigrants. And so their interests actually uh, are more in line with the anti-immigration aspects of the Republican Party. And I think that to some extent, they're waking up to the fact that the Democrats just use them for their votes, but aren't actually advancing their interests. They take them for granted because, as he says, when the rubber hits the road, that immigration issue is going to give the Democrats a permanent majority. And the Democrats already have the vast majority of the black vote, and it has not given them a permanent Democratic majority. It's just not enough. There are just not enough black Americans to give the Democrats that sort of a solid permanent majority. But if you can just continue to import foreigners who you know are going to vote left because you import them from so failed socialist states, they're going to vote overwhelmingly left. There's your permanent majority. So anyway, that's why they're going after Trump more than anything else. Um, <clears throat> because he threatens the mechanism of their permanent victory. And then in this last section, I want to just read, this is, last section is not very long. Um, he talks about unity versus individualism a little bit. He says, the only eternal principle is the good. What specifically is good in a political context varies with the times and with circumstance as does how best to achieve the good in a given context. The good is not tax rates or free trade. Those aren't even principles. In the American political context, the good is the well-being of the physical America and its people, well-being defined in terms that reflect both Aristotle and the American founding as their safety and happiness. That's what conservatism should be working to conserve. Trump seems to grasp that the best way to do so in these times is to promote more solidarity and unity. The conservatives, by contrast, think it means more individualism. Neither of these, either, is an eternal principle. Prudence calls for a balance. Few would want the maximized and forced unity of ancient Sparta or modern North Korea. Only fool libertarians seek the maximized individualism of Ayn Rand. No unity means no nation. No individualism means no liberty. In an actual republic, a balance must be maintained, which can require occasional course corrections. In 1980, after a decade of stagnation, we needed an infusion of individualism. In 2016, we are too fragmented and atomized. United, for the most part, only 
by being equally under the thumb of the administrative state and desperately desperately need more unity, which means that Trump right now is right and the conservatives are wrong. His moderate program of secure borders, economic nationalism, and America first foreign policy, all things that liberals and conservatives alike used to take for granted if they disagreed on implementation, holds the promise of fostering more unity, end quote. So, uh, this is obviously written before the election. Um, I think to it, it's a tough case to make that Trump is advancing more unity in the country, although um, depending on how you define unity, he's got the uh, he's got the Democrats up in arms and thinks that the Trump is tearing the country apart, but it's only because they're flipping out so hard. Uh, they're having such a conniption fit that they're like uh, it's like that scene in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas uh, when they're driving in the car and I, I don't remember. I, I think they had a bunch of coke. Dude had a bunch of cocaine out or something, and the wind blows and blows all the cocaine over all over the place or something. And, and the guy says, "Do you see what God just did to us, man?" And the and uh, the driver there, Hunter Thompson, says, "God didn't do that. You did that." Well, that's <laughs> that. That always the way the Democrats react always respond. Do you see what Trump just did to us, man? Trump didn't do that. You did that. You're the ones fr- freaking out. You're the ones trying to trying to have a protest uh, every week. You're the ones lighting cars on fire. You're the ones beating people up in the face. You're the ones snatching everybody's MAGA hat off. You're the ones screaming about concentration camps. You're the ones trying to impeach the president. Trump didn't do that. You did that. You're tearing apart the nation. Trump's trying to bring the nation together. But, um... You know, I, I, I digress. I think that the whole concept from a from a top level perspective, if you say that, you know, we should have um, cultural unity and we should cut our immigration, we should stop bringing in people who don't have roots here, who have roots elsewhere, who might not speak the language. Um, those that kind of thing adds to the fragmentation. If you've got 10 different languages being spoken on your street, that doesn't add to unity in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so if, you're, if you've are if you got a strong country with strong borders that is not interfering with the rest of the world, is minding its own business, is in the process of assimilating people into its culture, that drives unity, but it drives unity over the long term. It changes the country into a more unified state. Um, whereas the, the political strife of going against the plans of the administrative state creates a lot of tension and conflict because the administrative state doesn't want that to happen. That seems on the surface like disunity, but it's just a short term, uh, uh, convulsions of the process of repairing the nation. So I guess that's all I'm going to talk about now, about the time that I want to end this podcast. But um, Michael Anton, like I said, he's a boss. He he, I disagree with him on some basic, um, you know, m- maybe quasi metaphysical concepts about about justice and 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 reason and will and things like that. But um, in the practical application, uh, I'm really 100 percent on board with his. Ideas. The last and only thing that I want to say that a little bit disappointed me about this book is that early on he says that there are three important questions. Is it really as bad, uh, or, or how bad is it, or, or whatever? What do we do now? And what do we do over the long term? And he spends a lot of time in his initial essay, especially, talking about is it really as bad? And I think that he had been criticized a lot for for doom and gloom. And so he made a real effort to say, yes, it actually is as bad as I say. So, okay, you put a lot into that, which is great. It really is bad. What do we do now? Well, that's the whole point of the Flight 93 election. What do we do now? We put Trump in office. Uh, We keep Hillary Clinton out of office. That was when this was written. What do we do over the long term? That is largely neglected in this book. Uh, and that was kind of what I was hoping for, that he would say that, okay, well, Trump is in office. Now that the book – I mean the book came out this year. Trump is in office. He's been in office. Obviously, we're going to try to reelect him in 2020. But what do we do over the long term? Are we going to have to hold the White House indefinitely henceforth? 
Are we going to have to hold the White House for the next 20 years? Are we going to have to hold the White House? I mean, I would say we need to hold the White House and the Senate for another 25 years in order to turn this thing around. And number one, how do we do that? Number two, how do we turn this thing around while we do that? Uh, those are the real questions that we need to be asking. Uh, we need to be thinking long term. We can't just say, well, we are, we, one, one Democrat in the White House and this whole thing collapses. That's a black pill if I ever had one. There's no way we can keep the Democrats out of the White House forever. Particularly given their cultural control over all the other institutions and the other ways that he talks about in which the deck is stacked against us. But I will say this, whether Trump is reelected in 2020 or not, whether he is impeached or not, regardless of what happens with President Trump, as much as I support him, I've also got my criticisms, but as much as I support him, the enduring legacy of Donald Trump is the fundamental transformation of the Republican Party away from the neoconservatives and into the hands of the nationalists and the paleoconservatives. That is the enduring legacy. The transformation into a nationalist, populist conservatism. And also, the other thing that I thought was good to mention, just one last thing, is that he does say that Trump's three core issues are trade, America first foreign policy, and border control. And those are the same three core issues that I talked about back when I reviewed Day of Reckoning by Pat Buchanan. Uh, Trump really is following the Buchanan playbook uh, very closely. And I just want to point that out. This all comes from Pat Buchanan. He is a hero and uh, he has laid out some great ideas and I... I know I said I was going to review more of his books. Trust me, I've got more Pat Buchanan books that I'm going to be reviewing in the near future. Stick with me uh, at, because I will get to them soon. We're going to go into a lot more detail into all three of those aspects, both the border, uh, our foreign policy, and um, and our trade policy. So that's all for now. I hope you come back uh, next week for more great information here on Nature and the Nation, and I hope that you look me up on social media, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and uh, let me know what you think of the show. Uh, Till next time, bye.